Hi there, and uh, welcome to the first lecture in machine learning. Um, our goals for this lecture are relatively modest to, to sort of set up and formalize the machine learning problem. Okay, so we'll go through some introductory stuff. We'll introduce a concrete example in credit risk prediction as a running example throughout the theory. Um, and we'll summarize the learning problem and that uh, will constitute what we will talk about today. Um, before we begin, uh, formally speaking, let's uh, go through a little bit of the administrative stuff and what are the resources that are available to you to succeed in this course. So, the main resource is the course webpage, okay, and on this webpage, you will find everything that you need to succeed in this course, okay, including the course information, slides, assignments, due dates, link to submitting where you can hand in the assignments, and so on and so forth. Um, the textbook for the class is Learning from Data. Okay, so this is what it looks like if you've gotten yourself a copy of the book. I highly recommend it. We're going to be covering the first five chapters in the book, and then we'll move from the book to the e-chapters, which are freely available online at the book forum. Okay, so the book forum serves two purposes. The first is that it allows, it, it, that's where you can find the free e-chapters dealing with more advanced topics and techniques that we will introduce later on in the course. Um, and it also is a discussion forum where you can participate and look at what others are, are, are saying about exercises and problems. You can ask questions, people answer. Um, so hopefully you can make use of both of these, especially in this online edition of the course. Other resources, there are the, there are the TAs, there's myself. Please, I welcome you know, questions, email me questions. You know, I love it when you guys ask questions, so you know, don't hesitate on that. And uh, if you know, it, it's taking a long time for me to answer your question. It's not because I don't want to answer your question. I just get a long string of emails and, you know, there are many students in this class and I can only get to emails one by one. So, um, email us. Let us know if you have any concerns, questions, confusions. Okay, the prerequisites for this course are important. Um, there are mathematical prerequisites, linear algebra, probability, and calculus. So you need familiarity with those topics. We're not going to cover those topics. Now, assignment zero is a self-test. You can assign, you can try to work those problems, not work, but read through those problems and see if you understand and, and determine whether or not you could solve those problems. Okay, so do assignment zero. Um, it'll help you judge whether or not this course is for you. Um, this is a theory course. Yes, it's a theory course in machine learning, but machine learning is in and of itself a practical subject. We use it in the real world. So even though it's a theory course, we will build the links and mention the links wherever, wherever it's uh, you know, clear between the theory that we develop and the practical applications. Um, so linear algebra probability and calculus are in some sense essential to get the most out of this course. And you need to be able to program, because we will ask you to implement algorithms and, 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 and test certain things that we discuss in class and it, when we talk about the theory. And it's very important to see theory in practice, so you need to be able to program comfortably. We are not going to offer debugging help. We will offer help from the algorithmic perspective, you know. I don't quite understand this machine learning algorithm, but questions like, you know, I program this machine learning algorithm and it's, I, I don't know what's going on. My, my code doesn't compile and it doesn't run well, you know. Um, we are not going to be the primary resource for debugging of that kind. Okay. Now, that having been said, um, let, us, let me tell you about the storyline. And it's a very nice, clear storyline. So machine learning is this a subject that is now pervasive. But an important question to begin with is, what is it? What is learning? Okay. And we're going to try to pin that down. And once we pin that down, we're going to be faced with a fairly shocking consequence that you know, maybe it's not possible, so can we do it? So in what sense can we actually do machine learning? What, in what sense can we actually learn from data? Okay? And in that setting of, you know, the, the, the setting of when we can learn from data, how do we do it? Okay, so what is learning? Can we do it? How do we do it? Once we have settled those basic issues, those absolutely fundamental issues, then whenever you decide that you're going to try to develop something, you know, it's important to ask these fundamental questions, okay? And so we will, we will see that, you know, in a certain sense, yes, we can do it, otherwise this course would have been very short. Okay? And then the next question is, how do we do it well? How do we do it well? Okay. And uh, that's going to take us along the, along the lines of, you know, certain buzzwords like overfitting, regularization, and, and, and so not only must you be able to do it, but, you know, you now need to address the practical, the practicalities of real data and, and the real problem, 
And within the realm, within the constraints set by theory, there are bad ways to do things and much better ways to do things. And oh, that's what differentiates the expert from the amateur. Okay. And so we'll talk about how to do it well. Uh, sections one through four largely comprise the theoretical component, the hardcore theoretical component of this course. Okay. And even though it's a theoretical component, during revealing this theoretical component, you, we, will, we will talk about a very concrete model, which is the linear model, and that allows you to place all this theory within the context of a concrete model and, and actually run experiments and run basic machine learning algorithms relating to the can we do it and how do we do it and how do we do it well. So once we have covered the, the theory, we're going to step back you know, and summarize this into a set of general principles. Now, this, this is very useful when you go into the practical domains because you, know, you don't always want to be tangling with the math to solve very elementary problems. And so the general principles give you sort of rules of thumb, guidelines that, that, that are high level and, and link you know, the theory to best practices. Okay. So, sections one through five in this course, which is, is largely the first, let's say, two-thirds of the course, sets the theoretical foundation for learning. And then we will go and talk about more advanced techniques and other learning paradigms. Now, once you have grasped and fully understood sections one through five, you're ready to go out there. You are, you are competent. You're as good as an expert. Okay. The advanced techniques are icing on the cake. Maybe you can do a little bit more, a little bit. Uh, with, with slightly less assumptions, maybe neural networks a little bit more nonlinear, you know, support vector machines, a little bit more robust, and so on and so forth. So advanced, techni advanced techniques add that extra uh, dose of uh, icing, but you should be able to survive and do well in machine learning just based on the fundamentals. Okay, and then we will maybe touch on other paradigms, uh, but not that much. So the primary focus of this course is the supervised learning context, and we'll say more about what exactly supervised means in relation to other paradigms. Okay. We might touch on unsupervised learning, and we might touch on reinforcement learning, which is sort of the, the type of learning that we are most used to from human experience. Um, and so, you know, there's a healthy blend of theory and practice in this course, but nevertheless, I would still consider this course to be largely theoretical. Let me try to motivate you a little bit, okay? and I'm sure most of you do not need to be motivated that machine learning is everywhere today. And here's just a, a, a sampling of applications from you know, cancer detection, early cancer detection, you know, heart condition prediction. Here's an ecology application where the task is, you know, can we build an AI slash machine learning to recognize leaves? If so, then we can count, see if we can recognize, then we can you know, use a plane, take pictures, and then count leaves. And if we know the relative abundance of different types of leaves, i.e. different species of plants, then we know what's going on in the ecology. We know if the ecology is healthy or not, if there's too much pollution, and so on and so forth. Vision recognition, game playing. It turns out that, you know, some years ago, the best backgammon player in the world was an algorithm, a machine learning, a machine learned backgammon player that was trained using reinforcement learning. Okay, so that's interesting that, you know, machines have conquered back then and machines have conquered chess. Um, and, uh, you know, machines are conquering a lot of things. Okay. Uh, smart fridges, you know, when will your fridge start, you know, ordering milk for you, you know, and figure out that, oh, you know, it, uh, we think that you'd like this kind of milk since you like that kind of milk. Okay, here are a couple of applications that, you know, I have been subjected to. So here... On the top right is a, is, a, is a screenshot of Netflix when I logged in a few years ago. Uh, what they're doing is they're presenting for me recommended TV shows. So let's look at the first one, Wild Kratz. Mm, I have no idea what Wild Kratz is. Okay, so what's gone wrong here? Okay, so this is an interesting example where, you know, if you think about it, it looks like Netflix has messed up its prediction engine and it's predicting nonsense shows for me. But then if you look a little bit more closely, you'll see that all these shows it's, it's, it's recommending are kids' shows. And actually, it's not doing a bad job for the audience that it is expecting, which is my kids. It, was, it, it, it didn't expect me to pop up. And um, so this is an example of a complicated machine learning problem. And, you know, 
they got it right for my kid, but now I came along and it's completely wrong. And I'm very disappointed and I'm probably going to leave because I don't recognize any of these movies. So they made a mistake. They actually have since fixed this problem in a, in a, in a sort of manual way because it is a very hard problem. But this is just to show you that, well, they, got, they did a good job for my kids in terms of recommending movies. They did a bad job for me. And is there a way for them to have improved this machine learning engine? Okay, here's another example, Google. Um, I typed in at some point, you know, relight my pilot light, which is the light that's uh, used to light up my furnace that heats up the water in the basement. So sure enough, Google gave me search queries, but then it also recommended here Chris Afuli Brothers Heating, okay, which, is a, is, which is an extremely local, so not regional, not statewide, not countrywide, it's an extremely local plumbing and heating company. So somehow, you know, Google has done some sort of figuring out that, you know, maybe I'd be in the market for a heating and plumbing consultant. Now, they were not far off because before I was searching for this relighting of the pilot light, I was also, you know, browsing on some Home Depot and hardware store pages and so on and so forth. Okay, so Google in some sense might be considered to be the largest consumer of machine learning in the world in terms of both you know, how much it uses and how many times it has to be deployed. Every time someone searches, Google deploys this recommendation engine, which recommends both the order in which the search queries should appear and what ads should be shown. You might think the order is the order. Why does it matter on a person? Well, it, you know, they might have changed the order in which uh, they responded to my search query, depending on whether I had last visited Home Depot or last visited Best Buy. So there's a, there's a lot of complexity to this problem. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is that we're going to cover in this course the basic fundamental techniques of machine learning and the basic fundamental theory of machine learning that can essentially be adapted to solve all these problems. Now, these problems are not all of the same difficulty, but the underlying foundations and the underlying techniques are all very similar. So now it would be great if in this course I taught you the theory and the foundations and the techniques and then we went and solved some big problem like cancer. But that's well outside the scope of a 13, 14 week course. So we need to set our sights a little lower. And the good thing is that you know, the techniques and foundations that we reinforce in the problem that you are going to solve or attempt address in this course are the same techniques that can be used on these more difficult, more complex problems. Okay. And the problem that we're going to be using as the theme in this course is on the top left, which is this digit recognition task. And if you look at this, you know, the top left digit is a six, then a five, four, seven, three, six, three, one, zero, very easy for me to do. The question is, can we build a machine learning algorithm that can solve that same problem? Believe it or not, that problem is more or less solved now by machine learning algorithms and you know, most mail sorters that look at zip codes and then send the, the envelope to the right spot are uh, based on automated machine learning. Okay, so this is a problem that we know can be solved. We're going to develop foundational theory and techniques. Okay? And so those foundational theory and techniques should certainly apply to this problem. And you are going to demonstrate this in the course. And the, good, the, the beautiful thing here is that you know, those same techniques can be used to solve this whole array of problems. And, and that's the beauty in some sense of becoming a machine learning expert. You become a machine learning expert, you can, you, you, you can solve all these problems without really becoming an expert in any of those problems. You, know, you don't need to become a, 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 a cancer ex expert to solve, to some extent, the early detection of cancer problem, providing that you have the right data. Okay? And we'll get into all these details. Okay. So our next goal is to pin down what exactly is machine learning, what exactly is learning. And to help us get there, you know, I'm going to pose a question. So let's define a tree. So why don't you pause the video here? Pause the video and think about what is the definition of a tree. And now let me be more specific. By definition of a tree, I mean you, you know, you're going to write down a definition that, let's say, somebody could, you know, program in a flowchart or an algorithm or, an, or, or a computer, okay, and then take that, you know, flowchart, algorithm, computer, and go outside and identify everything that's a tree, and everything that, and everything that fails to fit your def definition will not be a tree. Okay. So think about what it takes to write down a definition of a tree, and just write it down. Pause the video. So pause the video now, write it down. 
Okay, so I'm back. If you pause the video, great. If you wrote down a tree, you're a great definer of, you wrote down a definition of a tree, you're a great definer of trees. And if you're here just for the ride, well, you know, probably most people who try to define a tree would say something like this. Okay, a tree is this object with a brown trunk. Move, the trunk is moving upwards and then it branches and then there are these green things called leaves, green little leaf-shaped things, let's say almost circular things that are hanging off the branches. Okay, and that's my definition of a tree. So let me show you some problems with this definition. So are these things trees? Now, the left guy is certainly a tree, and, and, and then when we look at the left guy and compare it to our definition, we realize that it's not that our definition was wrong, it's that it's not complete. So, you know, our definition works for a tree when you don't see the whole tree, but if you were to see the whole tree, then it's, you know, got roots. Okay? And so we would have to make a bigger definition, a more complicated definition, and then when we do that, we would still not know whether it's complete. Okay, what's going on on the right? Well, the right... Is, is what came out when I did a Google search, a Google image search for tree. It's not, it's not a recent search, maybe some time ago, but you know, this is what Google popped up. And what is this? This, this is actually called a tree. Um, so this is this thing that you put in your house when you have cats. Because you know, the cat lives indoors, but the cat likes to sharpen its nails or scratch its nails or you know, whatever on, on, on trees. And when there are no trees around inside the house, it's going to do it on your furniture. So in order to protect your furniture, you buy this thing, which is a tree. Then the, then the cat, you know, instead of scratching your furniture, comes and scratches this thing. Well, that's nice. And you look at this in, in, in great admiration that you have managed to con the cat into thinking this is a tree. No way, Jose, no way. Okay. The cat is by no means conned into thinking that this thing is a tree. It knows this is not a tree, but you know it says whatever you know you you, you silly human. I'll I'll pretend it's a tree for you. <clears throat> now, how do I know that the cat, or how, wh why am I so sure that the cat ha has no inclination that this is a tree? Well, so we had a hard time defining trees. Now, let's see if we can recognize trees. Okay, so I showed this set of pictures to my five-year-old daughter, and said, "Which pictures have a tree?" And without any hesitation, she. She pulled up this tree cartoon, okay, which is already amazing because it's not a real tree, it's a cartoon of a tree. And it's not upright, it's rotated, but nevertheless she got it. Okay. This picture has a tree with giraffes, she does, you know. This picture has a tree and this picture has a tree. Now what is this thing on the bottom right, this strange thing? Okay, nevertheless she got all the four trees correct, and all the four non-trees correct. Now, that's interesting for a five-year-old to have absolutely no problem in identifying the trees. And I assure you, she has never seen these pictures before. So it's not that she had seen these pictures and committed to memory or memorized that, you know, these four things here are trees and these four things here are not trees. In fact, I'm pretty sure that she has never seen this object before. This is a baobab tree. It grows in Africa, close to where I was growing up. And, you know, you don't see this thing in, in the USA, which is the entire life of my daughter. Okay, so something special is going on here, and it's not that anyone ever gave my daughter a definition of a tree. Okay. So, somehow, she is able to seamlessly and flawlessly recognize trees, okay, despite not having a definition. She has learned what a tree is. Now, how did that happen? How that happened is that, you know, through her experience, walking around with me in the, in the yard, let's say, I, I say, well, that's a tree, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a car, that's a bicycle, and so on and so forth. And it is all data that's being pushed into her mind, which she keeps. Okay. And now, all of a sudden, you know, five years later or three years later, I come around and say, well, is that a tree? She says, yes. Says, well, is that a tree? She says, yes. Well, is that a tree? Yes. Well, is that a tree? No, that's a cat. Okay. Do you know the definition of a cat? Nope. Do you know the definition of a tree? Nope. But she gets it all right. So somehow, just by looking at pictures, some of which were told to her are trees and some of which were told to her are not trees, something else, she has managed to extract some working definition of a tree, some working pattern of what constitutes a tree. Okay, Even though she has never been told what a tree is, okay? and that working pattern that she has extracted worked flawlessly for things that she never saw before. Okay. Now, in this whole story is embedded exactly what learning is. 
and you know um, our goal for this lecture is to pin that down okay? and then at the end of the day we'll have a mathematical formulation and that will be the formulation that pretty much we will use for the rest of the course <clears throat> so the punchline is defining the tree is hard that's kind of like writing down a formula for what is a tree but it appears to be easy both for the cat and for the five-year-old girl to recognize a tree after having been presented data on what are and what are not trees so after having learned from data it's easy for the five-year-old to recognize trees but it's hard for me a very sophisticated 45 year old to come up with a definition of a tree okay. let's look at another example um, and this happens to be an example that you know has financial uh, incentives so you know I already showed you Netflix and you know where in an example where Netflix got it completely wrong for me and you know I almost canceled my Netflix membership now imagine there are a hundred Netflix users and we each pay 10 bucks a month you know and if Netflix can convince us to keep our membership one month longer just one month longer that's a hundred million times ten one billion dollars okay. so you can clearly see that it's in Netflix interest for me to not cancel my membership as long as possible and all the other whatever hundred million customers I don't know if it's 100 million, but whatever it is. Okay. And it's going to keep me as a customer longer if it can convince me that you know there's a lot of stuff there for me to watch. And it can convince me that there's a lot of st stuff there for me to watch if it can continuously produce movies that I would like to watch. So Netflix would like to predict how will a viewer rate a movie, in particular me. Okay. Why? We just said because you know in that in that way it can improve the movie recommendations it gives customers customers think that Netflix is this great place with all these movies that they like even though they don't see the other movies they don't like and so they continue to be members okay in fact um, on this particular issue Netflix was willing to put money where its mouth is and offered one million dollars for just a 10% improvement in its movie rating system you know, you can think that, you know, this is perfectly justified if a 10% improvement in my recommendations causes me, me and uh, another 100 million people to stay one month longer. Well, that's a billion dollars at stake. So a million is nothing. I'll offer a million. And the fact that they offered a million suggests that probably they were thinking a billion is, is indeed at stake. Okay. So this is a real problem. Okay. And the question is, how do we solve it? And you can think back to the story of the five-year-old who looked at data when I'm discussing sort of the approaches or, 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 or discussing the setting of this Netflix problem. Okay. So, point number one. There is something that we could consider to be a viewer's taste. Okay. Some kind of a profile of a viewer. I like comedy. I like action. I like blockbuster movies. I like movies with lots of, you know, good sound and lots of good looking actors or actresses what have you right i have a profile so the way you can think of that is there's a vector you know there's a there's a vector of attributes okay that represents me as a viewer now those same attributes for example the fact that i like comedy okay, can be matched to whether or not a movie has a high comedy content Okay, so there's my, my viewer taste, which is described by a set of attributes, like how much do I like comedy, how much do I like action, and we can correspondingly assign to a movie how much of each attribute does the movie have. And it is reasonable to expect that, you know, if you knew a viewer's tastes, and if you knew a movie's content with respect to those tastes, then there should be some magical formula that you can use and convert that into a single number which is how much do you think that viewer would like that movie okay. so let's call this magical formula a pattern a pattern that relates viewer taste and movie you know content to how much the viewer would rate that movie okay. now key we don't know what that formula is 
Because if we did, or for example, if Netflix did, then they wouldn't need to put out this $1 million price. So we don't know what that formula is. Okay. So just like the child who doesn't know what's the definition of a tree, Netflix doesn't know how to specifically write down a formula that converts a viewer taste and a movie content to a rating. And, but just like the child who has lots of pictures through their experience or lots of experience of looking at things that have been told to them as being trees and looking at things where they have been told those are not trees, Netflix has a lot of data. And, you know, what does this data consist of? This, this data consists of a viewer comes along having watched a particular movie and rates it. Okay. So, even though Netflix doesn't know exactly how to uh, define or compute a viewer's taste and doesn't know what the magical formula is that connects taste plus content to rating, Netflix has a lot of data in which viewers have told them the rating, which indirectly in some sense gives information about how their taste has, has interacted with the movie content. Even though we don't know the taste and we don't know the movie content, we know the interaction because the the, the reviewer, the viewer rated that movie. Okay, so we have a lot of data. And then the question becomes, can we reverse engineer that data? Okay, and that is where the learning comes in. Can we reverse engineer that data and, and back out what exactly a viewer's tastes are based on all the movies they rated? Okay, and what exactly is the content of a movie based on all viewers that rated a movie? If we can back those out in a way that's consistent with all the ratings that we have observed, okay, then, we have a, then we have obtained the first step in, 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 in predicting a viewer's rating, which is for each viewer we will know what is the taste vector, and for each movie we will know what is its content vector. Okay. Now, that entire process is complicated, and we, we can discuss sort of, you know, methods for doing this, which is sort of this bilinear model, and we'll discuss the linear model later. The bilinear model, which, is, which was used to win this competition, is very similar. Okay. But instead of getting into the details of exactly how this problem can be solved, I want to extract high-level details. Okay. And the most important high-level detail here and, you know, is that there is some pattern, there is some formula, there is some relationship between you know, a viewer's taste and movie con and a movie's content and the rating that they would give to that movie. Okay. So this pattern is fundamental. Okay, so this pattern exists. So there's a pattern, it exists. There's some pattern. Okay. We don't know it. Okay, because if we did know it, we just implement it and we're done. Okay. And just, just like with Netflix, we have a lot of data to learn it. So this is now going to be our class model. And why is this going to be our class model? Because this is exactly the situation in which machine learning applies. Okay. So there is some pattern that exists. Okay. Because if there's no pattern that exists, then there's nothing to learn. Okay. We don't know it, because if we did know it, again, there's nothing to learn. Okay. And there's a pattern, we don't know it. At this point, we're stumped. And the only thing that allows us to make progress, short of giving us the pattern, is give us some data that has somehow in it embedded, sort of, indirectly, the pattern. Okay. And then the machine learning task is to reverse engineer. Okay, is to reverse engineer the, the data to, to extract the pattern. Okay. And then why do we care? Well, it's not the reverse engineering of the data to extract the pattern that's important. Netflix doesn't care about the pattern. What Netflix cares about is when I or some other user logs into Netflix for the next time, okay, it's going to compare my viewer taste with all the movies it has available and make a set of recommendations to me. That's what Netflix cares about. Okay. So while, yes, it's nice that you know, we have data and we're going to try to reverse engineer the pattern, and it would be nice to know the pattern. At the end of the day, I don't really need to know the pattern. All I need to know is for this viewer, what will they rate that movie? Okay. And so that's how I'm going to test myself. I'm not going to test myself by, you know, how nice is the pattern that you 
extracted from the data? How aesthetic is it? How you know compact is it? You know how how reasonable is it? We don't care about the pattern per se. What we care about is the performance of the pattern or whatever pattern we think we have extracted on some new test case. The test case could be me arriving and you showing me another movie, a movie that you think I would like. Okay. So that's a fairly complicated problem. The solution is fairly complicated, but it has these three ingredients. There's a pattern, we don't know it, we have data to learn it. Okay. Let's simplify more and get to an even more concrete problem. And this problem will be concrete enough that we can use it as a template to, 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 to pin down and extract the, the main players in this sort of machine learning game, which corresponds to this high level class model of a pattern exists, we don't know it, we have data to learn it. Okay. And that is credit approval. Okay. So it's a very conceptual example, it's a very concrete example, but it will help us to crystallize the issue. So here's a, here, here's a, Think of this as a you know think of this as somebody who's you know, graduated from college, had a job for let's say ten years, so thirty two years old, male, salary forty k, had this twenty six k in debt, um, has been on the on in his current job for one year, has lived at his current residence for three years, and so on and so forth. These are the kinds of questions that a typical credit card application or a loan application will get from you. Okay. Now here's the question. Do you approve for credit or not? So you're a banker. Do you give this guy 15K credit card or not? A very simple question. Answer is yes or no. Okay. And uh, you know, some people might say yes, some people might say no. Uh, but at the moment, we're not gonna focus on whether what the correct answer is. At the moment, we're focusing on there is some you know magical formula that could take this input and output the correct answer. In other words, you know, it's not a random guess whether or not you should approve this guy for credit. Okay, it's not a random guess. There is some relationship between these, you know, input attributes of a of an applicant and whether or not you should. So there's some pattern. There's some magical formula. We don't know it because if we did know it, we wouldn't even be discussing. The banks would all have implemented it. They'd all be assigning credit perfectly. Nobody would default on debt and so on and so forth. Okay, so we don't know it. And banks have a lot of data. So they get you know, many, 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 many applications for credit a month. Some of them they reject, and some of them they accept. And then of the ones they accept, you know, some of them pay back the credit, and some of them default. Okay. So there's a bunch of people they've rejected, there's a bunch of people who defaulted, and there's a bunch of people who have been good Ups, fine upstanding credit card holders. Okay. So from this data, okay, could we reverse engineer the magical formula that links an applicant's attributes to whether or not they should get that credit card? Okay. Now, again, we don't care about that formula. All the bank really cares about is when the next applicant comes, I'm going to use whatever formula you reverse engineered to say yes or no. And the only thing that matters is was I right on that test application. Okay, so to summarize, you know, we have these attributes of, a, of an applicant. We don't know a magical formula for approving credit, okay. but we know that it exists. Okay. And banks have lots of data, so we can try to learn this formula. Okay. Think back to the five-year-old. You know, there is some magical formula slash pattern that when you look at a picture, if it contains a tree, the picture will have a particular pattern, and if it doesn't, it will not have that particular pattern. So the pattern exists, but the five-year-old doesn't know what that pattern is. The five-year-old doesn't know the definition of a tree. Okay? But the five-year-old has a lot of data based on you know five years of growing up with people telling her what is and is not a tree. Okay? And the five-year-old has managed to reverse engineer that data and, and, and produce a representation in her mind of what the pattern is that constitutes a tree. And then the five-year-old has used that pattern. Whether or not the pattern is right or wrong is irrelevant. The five-year-old used that pattern to identify the trees in the picture and got them all right. So we don't even care if her definition or her internal pattern of a tree is right or wrong. What we care about is she got all her tests correct. 
get the same thing here. Reverse engineer the pattern, but I'm not really interested in the pattern. I'm interested in whether you're going to get the next credit card applicant correct or incorrect. Okay. So that's the setup. Machine learning is relevant when you know that there's a pattern that you're trying to learn. You don't know the pattern, otherwise you wouldn't be trying to learn it. Okay. And you need somehow, some way to learn it. Okay. You can't learn it from a vacuum. So you have data. And really, you know, in most practical situations, you know, a pattern exists and we don't know it. So the crucial aspect is the data. So if someone comes to me and says, you know, here's a fan fancy machine learning problem and blah, 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 and look at how interesting it is and how cute and so on. I say, okay, great, yes, but if it's going to be a machine learning problem, you know, what data do you have? That's the first question you ask. Do you have data? If you have data, let's talk. If you don't have data, you know, you need someone else's help. Okay, now, if you have data, then are you sure that there's a pattern? Are you sure that there's a relationship between you know, what you can observe, like a credit card applicant's features, okay, and what you're trying to predict? If there's no reason to believe there's a, there's a relationship, then again, I'm not, I'm not your guy. So, but if you think there's a relationship, you have the data, okay, then let's talk. Okay. Now let's pin this down mathematically. And um, I want to in the process also show you the other mode in which I'm going to be presenting material to you, which is sort of a blackboard lecture. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to now, uh, for in, within the context of this credit approval, we're going to extract the key players, and those key players are generic to any machine learning problem. So here we go, board lecture. Okay. So. The key players. Okay. And, and always have in mind, you know, the, the credit card example. So let's begin with the application. So you have a person applies, so applicant. Well, you know, you know, we can't capture everything about an applicant. So there are certain things that we capture about the applicant, you know, salary, age, debt, and so on. Okay, so the applicant's uh, attributes, the applicant's features. Well, you know, what are these? Well, we, we can just represent them by a, a bunch of numbers. So if you have 10 such things that you collect, then you'll represent it by 10 numbers or a vector of size 10. So we'll represent the applicant's attributes, and we will generically call it the input x. Okay. Now, you know, we don't need to restrict ourselves to exactly 10 features. So generically, we will say that x belongs to a d-dimensional vector space, in which, in which case there are d attributes that have been collected. Okay. Now. What's the goal? The goal is to say yes or no in this particular case. Okay, so should you approve for credit or not? Okay. Well, this decision we're going to call the output. Okay, now we could encode the output as yes or no, but it's generally more convenient to exclusively live with numbers. And so an equivalent way of, of encoding yes or no is just to say that, you, you know, you're supposed to say plus one for yes or minus one for no. Okay. So the output is either plus one or, or minus one. And this output we will generically call y. So in this case, the output belongs to the, uh, a finite set, plus or minus one. This is called uh, a classification output because you're classifying the input vector x, i.e. you're classifying the applicant into one of two categories, yes or no. Now, you know, as we progress, we will, you know, we will see that, you know, you know, you can have a very different types of problems where, you know, y may be more than one class. So, for example, in, digit, in the digit recognition problem that I showed you, which will be the one we use throughout the class, you know, the possible outputs are 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. So there are 9 classes. Okay. 
it's possible that instead of telling me yes or no for credit, it's possible that you say, you know, don't tell me yes or no for credit, tell me the credit level. Well, in that case, the, the output is any, any positive real number. Okay. So whatever the output is, you know, it belongs to some space. Okay. In this particular case, plus or minus one. So generically, what you are asked to say for a particular input x, we're going to call the output y. Okay. Now, remember that you know, if we're going to attempt to do machine learning, we assume there's a relationship, a pattern exists. Okay, so that's the first non-trivial assumption. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this pattern, now, there are many different forms that this pattern can take. Okay, but to simplify the discussion, we're going to assume that the pattern that we, 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 we say hypothetically exists, okay, or that we assume exists, is going to take the form of a function. Okay, and we call that function the target function. Target function. So in other words, there's a function which tells you what's the correct y for any particular x. So the target function f, you know, is maps x to y. Or we could say that you know, y equals f of x. Okay. Now let's state the most fundamental ingredient in the machine learning problem. So remember, we, or the class motto, a pattern exists, we don't know it. Okay, so a pattern exists, we don't know it. What does that mean? That means that this target function f is unknown. No. Okay. Do you really mean unknown? I mean unknown. Okay. Now, of course, the problem gets a little bit easier if I tell you something about the target function. I tell you this, or I tell you that, or I tell you this. But that just that just restricts the target function to some other set, and within that set, it's completely unknown. Okay. But as as a as a most basic assumption. We must maintain that the target function is unknown. Okay. And if you try to think about it, try to think about what kind of a function relates an absolutely generic picture and outputs plus or minus one if there's a tree. It's probably this very complicated, bizarre target uh, function, okay. which is truly unknown. It could be almost anything. Okay. Um, now, this is one of the things that makes machine learning very hard. But maintaining that assumption is one of the things that's going to allow whatever theory we develop to be absolutely broadly applicable. Okay. So if we can develop a theory of learning that applies to this situation where the target function is absolutely unknown, then it's absolutely general. Okay. All right. So, remember, a pattern exists. We don't know it. Okay. And if this thing exists, if this target function f exists and we don't know it, well then, how are we going to, in any way whatsoever, figure it out? Because it's completely unknown, and that's where the data comes in. So we have data. And so let's pin down exactly what data is. So <clears throat> we're going to assume that even though we don't know f, we're going to have data which consists of 
examples of F in action. So, the data consists of examples of F in action. So what does that mean? That means, just like in the credit application scenario, when you think about what's the data, you have a whole bunch of applications. Well, a whole bunch of applications corresponds to a whole bunch of inputs. So you have a whole bunch of inputs, x1, x2, x3, xn. You have a whole bunch of inputs. And somehow, for those inputs, you have managed to obtain f. In other words, should you have uh, uh, approved credit or not in the case of credit application. So somehow you have managed to ob obtain F, which means that you have obtained Y1, Y2, Y3, up to Yn, where Yi is equal to F of Xi. Somehow. Now, this collection of examples is what we call the data. We'll call this the data set, and sometimes we will say it's a data set of size n. Okay. <clears throat> um, so get used to this notation because it's going to be used for the whole semester, okay, throughout the whole course. X is the input, Y is the output, the unknown target function is F, the data is x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and so on, up to xn, yn, where each y is f applied on the corresponding x. Now you might ask, well, how did I get this data? Hmm, very good question. Okay. Now, for the moment, don't care. That's not the content of the machine learning. Okay. The assumption here is that we have this data. Now, as we develop the theory, we're going to see that as we develop the theory and ask the question, can we learn? And then we say, oops, it doesn't look like we can learn. But then we come back and say, oh, but maybe it is possible to learn. And then we build the theory and so on and so forth. That's going to dictate some properties that the data set should have. Okay. So modulo those properties that the data set should have. It's not my business as the machine learner to know how you got the data. You just need to Give me the data satisfying the theoretical properties that I need. Okay, one of those properties is this most fundamental property that y equals f of x. Now we'll be able to relax this uh, to the situation where we say y is approximately f of x. In other words, it's f of x plus some noise. That's not going to be a problem. But fundamentally, the y's are related to the x's through this unknown target function f. Okay, and so the data, even though we don't know f, the data is indirectly giving us some information about F. Okay. And so we're going to try to reverse engineer F. Now, we may not get exactly F. Okay. But what matters is whatever we get, you know, we are going to use in the future. Okay. So it's not... <clears throat> okay. Um, you might, well, you might say, well, that's, that's very disappointing, Malik. You know, you're saying that the data, which is a fundamental um, ingredient into the machine learning problem, and then you're not telling us how to get the data. Well, that's because I'm focusing more on the machine learning problem, but yes, I'm not going to tell you how to get the data. Nevertheless, it is very important how, how the data was obtained and that it must satisfy the theoretical properties that we need of the data. Now, let me give you an that having been said, even though that's not the focus, let me give you an example of how we could get the data in the credit application. Well, we have all these people who applied. Okay. And let's say we gave all the people we gave credit to, so that's these N people. We gave credit to them. Some of those people defaulted, so these are the defaults. And some of those people did not default, so they paid, paid off. Well, in this situation, we could say, well, this was a bad idea. So you should not have given these people credit. So the answer should have been no. In other words, we can sort of infer that f of x for all these defaults, we can infer that f of x should have been minus 1. So we would put all these y's to minus 1. The x's exist by default in the bank. 
Okay, and we should set all these y's to plus one because they all are paid off, which means that it was a good idea to give them credit. So here's an example where we were able to extract a data set which represents this target function for the particular machine learning problem of credit approval. If you think very carefully, and I'm not, I don't want to get into it now, but if you think very carefully, you'll, you'll see that there might be something a little bit fishy about this data set, the way I've constructed it, and we'll deal with that later. Okay. But there's an example of how we could create the data set. Okay. Um, so this is the setup where we say that machine learning is relevant. A pattern exists, F, we don't know it, F is unknown, we have data, okay. data set x1 to x. So let's put this in some kind of a box. Okay, so you have an unknown target function. f of x and this unknown target function we're going to use it we don't explicitly use it but we indirectly use it for example in this example in, in this credit card uh, approval so we indirectly use it or we basically assume it has been used in order to get my data set which is you know, yi equals f of xi. Now, I don't see f, but what I see is the result of applying f to xi. So I have a data set which consists of pairs xi, yi. So we have x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. x big N, y big N. The big N is the number of data points. Okay, good. So in some sense, this picture summarizes that entire discussion where implicitly we have this x, the input, we have the y, the, the desired output. Okay, we have a data set, which is examples of f in action. Okay, good. Mm, okay, let me erase, uh, since this is all now contained in, in that picture. Let's talk about the learning. So, learning. So what's, what do I mean by let's talk about the learning? What's, what's all this? This is just the setup that says machine learning is a plausible, is a feasible approach to reverse engineering F. The process that actually does that reverse engineering is what we're calling learning. So, let's put it in quotes, getting F somehow. Now, how do we get F? Well, you know, if we could get F exactly from the data, that would in almost any case be a miracle. So in general, we're going to assume that we're not going to produce F. Okay. So whatever learning means, the result of the learning is going to be an approximation to F. Now, that's without loss of generality. That doesn't, that doesn't exclude the possibility of producing F. So we will say that the result of learning is an approximation to F. And we will call it G. Okay, so G is the output of learning. So G is a beast of the same form as F. In other words, G maps X to Y. Okay, much the same way as F maps X to Y. So F and G are uh, functions from 
uh, same input x to output space y. So if we're talking about classification, f takes x and produces plus or minus 1, g takes x and produces plus or minus 1. So classification is the credit application. OK. Um, so we need to sort of decide what does it mean to have learned. Okay. And here we are exactly pinning down the learning problem. Okay. So what does it mean, mean to have learned? So let me throw out a couple of possibilities. Possibility one. Well, you know, since we have a data set, okay, and we know that, you know, for each of the x's in our data set, y is the corresponding x, uh, f of x, so we know that yi is equal to f of xi. So wouldn't it be nice if yi is also equal to g of xi? So let's see what does that mean. What that means is that um, G is able to reproduce exactly F on the data set. And, and why don't you pause the video for a moment and think to yourself, you know, is that worth anything to me? Okay, so if you pause the video, great. If you didn't, then I'm here just for the ride. So here's the news flash. Why? Why would I go through all of this hassle if the only thing that comes out of it is that I can reproduce on the x's that are in the data set the y's that are also in the data set? What am I going to use this g for? It's of no use. I already knew these y values. I don't need g to tell me those y values. I've wasted my time. So in some sense, yes, this would be nice, but is of no use to me. Okay, now let's think back to the, the five-year-old uh, telling me which pictures had trees. Okay. Those pictures the five-year-old never saw, and now I'm impressed because, wow, you never saw these pictures and you figured out which ones had trees. Let's talk about Netflix. Netflix doesn't care about predicting the rating of a movie that I already rated. Netflix cares about predicting the rating of a movie that I have not yet rated. Okay. And let's talk about the credit card application. The bank doesn't care about whether you say yes or no to uh, 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 an applicant who they've already either denied or approved, and then you match. You say, oh, you, 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 you approved that applicant? Well, I agree. Oh, you, you, you rejected that applicant? Well, I agree. Bank doesn't care about that. Bank wants to know what to do on a new applicant. Okay. So let's try again. What does it mean to have learned? Okay, and we can come back to the actual statement here. The result of learning is an approximation to f. Okay, so what it means to have learned is that g is approximately equal to f. And we've already said that we don't care about the data set. So that means that, you know, we care about outside the data set. g is approximately equal to f for the next test input. Let's call that, just for the moment, let's call it x star. So that would be a way to quantify the fact that g is approximately equal to f for the context that's relevant to machine learning. It's true that if g is equal to f on the data set, then in some sense g is approximately equal to f. But we don't care about that. What we care about is that g is approximately equal to f for some unknown test input. Now, this in its entirety is the definition of learning, is, is what it means to learn in its entirety. Okay. So we can drop all this other rigmarole and just box this statement and we're done. 
So learning is the act of producing an approximation to the unknown target function f. I don't care how you do it. Okay, that's the definition of I have learned. Okay. And now what we've done is we, we've put that task of producing an approximation to f in a very specific context. What's the context? I'm going to give you some help in producing that approximation. What's the help I'm going to give you? I'm going to give you this data set. So you are tasked not with in some, in some arbitrary, out of the ether way, producing G, you're allowed to use the data set to produce G. But at the end of the day, the only thing I care about is that G is approximately F for the next time I need to make a decision. Okay. So that's the definition of learning. So let's put it in a box. The output of learning, so put an arrow here saying that this is the output, is G, which is approximately equal to F. In other words, G on some unknown test point, unknown as of now, unknown as of the time at which you have performed the learning, is, let's say, approximately equal to F of X star. Well, approximately equal to depends on what the nature of the output is. If it's binary classification, then we want equals. So if this is yes, then this should be yes. If it's setting the credit limit, then approximately makes sense. So if, if the true credit limit is 10,000 and you said 9,800, that's pretty good. Okay. So when we define the learning problem, F is defined. It's unknown, but it's fixed and well-defined. It exists. The data set is given to you. Given, fixed, the target function is fixed, but it's unknown. Okay, the goal is universal. You want to output an approximation to the unknown target function. It's fixed, but it's unknown. Okay. And so then the question is, how do we go from what's given we can't change it to the goal in some way ensuring that we achieve learning. So this is what learning outputs. Okay, and now what I'm going, to, I'm going to propose to you is a very simple way of accomplishing this task. It's very simple, but we don't lose any generality in how we're going to accomplish this task. Okay. So the first thing is, you know, we're going to need some way of going from the data to the output. So let's call that the learning algorithm. Hey, okay. nice. Well, that's totally generic. There's, there's nothing, there's no content to this statement. There's some magic that we're going to do that takes us from the data set to the learned final hypothesis G. By the way, this is called the final hypothesis. So it's a hypothesis about what is F. May or may not be right. Ideally, it's close. Okay. Eh, you can't argue with this. There's nothing to argue with. You know doing some magic and I'm not telling you what the magic is. Okay. Later in the class we will tell you what this magic could look like. Okay. But for the moment I do something that converts the data set into my learned final hypothesis G. Okay. But what I can do in some, in some, in some senses is narrow down this A to a, a, a plausible type of learning algorithm, one which says the following. Okay. So I'm going to define a hypothesis set. So I'm, I'm, I'm aiming to pull out a final hypothesis G. So let me define a hypothesis set. Let's call it script H. Okay. And what is this hypothesis set? It's a whole bunch of functions that live in the same space as F. Okay. So that map X to 1. Let's call that set of functions 
script H and you know just for convenience I'll, I'll imagine that it's a listable set but it may not be okay and it consists of the hypotheses H1, H2, H3 and so on okay so it's a, it's a set of hypotheses well no big deal here okay I, I defined a set of hypotheses H and I am going to assume that this set of hypotheses is fixed ahead of time. What do I mean by ahead of time? Before you see the data. Okay, now you might wonder, whoa, 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 whoa. How am I going to fix that hypothesis set? How do I know how to fix it? But we're not going to worry about that for the moment. For the moment, we're just setting up a very general framework. And I'm going to argue that it is a without loss of generality. So I'm not telling you what to fix it to. I'm just saying it is fixed ahead of time before you see the data. Okay. And what is the purpose of having this fixed hypothesis set? The purpose of having this fixed hypothesis set is your learning algorithm is going to be restricted. In what way is it going to be restricted? It's only allowed to pick as G one of the hypotheses that are in H. So this guy H is also feeding in to my learning algorithm A and my learning algorithm A is forced, constrained to pick a hypothesis from H. But how it picks the hypothesis we're not specifying. So there's some magic that we still need to specify. But what it does is at the end of the day produces one of the hypotheses in H for G. So in other words, G will ultimately belong to H. Okay. And now you're probably stepping back and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. You started off by saying, oh, this is going to be completely general, completely general unknown F of arbitrary complexity or whatever. Okay. And then you restrict me to fixing a hypothesis set before I see the data. So F is unknown. I haven't seen the data, so I don't know anything about my machine learning problem that I'm about to be asked to solve. And then you're asking me to fix a hypothesis set? Hmm. Okay. So have we lost all generality here? Am I going to fix this hypothesis set to something special? No. So I'm still maintaining all generality. Okay. And to, to, to convince you of this, it's exactly because I haven't specified what this is. So, you know, if you want, go ahead and choose this H to be every possible hypothesis on Earth. So, one choice. H equals everything. Okay. This specific setup does not prevent that. So that is just to convince you that we have not lost any generality here. So this is a perfectly general framework in which you can produce a, a final hypothesis G. If you want, consider H to be everything, everything you want. Okay, And then it's not a restriction at all. And then the algorithm, that's where all the magic goes on. The algorithm is going to pick one of those H's and produce it as G. No loss of generality. So this is a perfectly general paradigm. No downside, no loss of generality, but, and here's the big but, okay. It is, however, opening the door that if we carefully choose this H, we may be able to get a better G. Okay. So there's no downside because you can certainly implement this paradigm with the most general H on earth. Okay. So there's no downside. But there is a possible upside if we can figure out somehow what's a better H to put in here. Okay. And a lot of the content of the theory that we will shortly start discussing after we define the learning problem more carefully and, and discuss whether or not it's feasible, a lot of the content of, you know, of, 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 of being a good machine learner is figuring out what's the right H to put in here. But that doesn't retract, that doesn't detract anything from this general framework. 
Okay. This general framework is perfectly general. There's nothing lost here by saying that you had to fix a hypothesis set ahead of time. Okay. It turns out that even though there's nothing lost, the fact that you fix this hypothesis set to H ahead of time, the fact that you fixed it ahead of time is going to make a lot of the theory go through. Okay. And then when we see that theory, it'll say that, you know, yes, it's great that you fixed it ahead of time because that made the theory go through. But also, when you did that, the theory is now going to start making recommendations for other H's other than this most general possible. Okay. In fact, it's not possible to learn with the most general, even though that's allowed in here, it's not possible to learn with the most general H. And the theory that we will discuss is going to precisely set, set limits on H. Okay. And, you know, what are those limits that it's going to set on H? Well, you know, what we're going to... Okay, I, I lied a little bit. You know, you have to fix H ahead of time without knowing the data set, but you are allowed to know the number of data points you have. Okay. And so the theory will work for any fixed H. Okay. In particular, it'll also work for H being everything. But then the theory will say that, you know, and, and it'll still work if you know H, if you know N. Okay before fixing your hypothesis. And the theory will say that, you know, depending on the number of data points, there's a, there's a good way to choose H and there's a bad way to choose H. Okay. Now, well, the thing is that that theory will fall apart if you looked at the data before you fixed your hypothesis. So while there's no loss of generality here, there's going to be good practice okay in choosing h and in order to allow that upside to realize it is absolutely essential that you did not you that you fixed h ahead of time okay so let's box this nice beautiful flow chart And I'm going to, you know, simply state that this is the setup of the learning problem. Okay, so let me summarize. You have an unknown target function, f. That target function is indirectly responsible, even though you don't directly have access to it. You may have access to it in some situations, or you may not. But it, 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 for machine learning to be applicable, you have to have a set of examples, the data set, which, rep which represents the target function in action. Okay. So given this data set, we have to somehow produce a final hypothesis G, which approximates the target function F. Okay. And how we do that is very simple. There's some magic which is undisclosed yet, is as, of, as, of, as of now undisclosed magic, which is going to take the data set as input Okay, and produce this final hypothesis. So somehow this G is going to depend on the data, and the data depends on F, so indirectly G depends on F. Okay. G is good if it works on an unknown test point. Okay. And now we're going to restrict the workings of this algorithm in the following way, that this algorithm is going to have to, require to pick G from a fixed candidate set of hypotheses, which we call the hypothesis set. And let me just re-emphasize that having to fix this candidate set of hypotheses before you see the data is not a loss of generality. You can always pick it to be everything, every hypothesis, and, you, and then, you know, we're back in, in, in sort of this general framework where everything is, is, is pumped into the magic of A. So you can think of A as a two-step process. The algorithm starts by fixing a hypothesis set, then it gets the data, then it uses the data and its prefixed hypothesis set to produce G. Okay. It turns out there's a lot of upside to be gotten from fixing H, and we will discuss that. Okay, so you know that's that's all for today, and see you at the next lecture.